Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Well, many thanks for joining us on the Journal of Biophilic Design today. We're really thrilled to be joined by an amazing and different expert, um, Steve Tonkin. He is Dark Skies Advisor to the International Dark Sky Reserve based at Cranbourne Chase Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty in Wiltshire. Um, he's going to also be uh, writing uh, a feature in our Blue Mind edition, which is issue six of the Journal of Biophilic Design. So if you haven't seen a copy yet, um, do go to our website or also to Amazon and um, search for uh, obviously the Journal of Biophilic Design. This will be issue six. And there's an ebook and also a printed version. But he's going to be writing about the importance of dark skies uh, for wildlife, for nature. And of course, nature that includes us as well. So, uh, Steve, many thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's lovely. Um, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? How did you get involved in Dark Skies? And what was your background? Well, I can I can date to when it actually started, when I actually became aware of it. And that was the 4th of October, 1957. <laughs> um, my dad took me outside to see if we could see Sputnik go over, which was being launched the previous day. Um, at the time, we were living in Africa, was eight miles outside of Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. And it was my first time, little me, looking up at a pristine dark sky, actively looking at it for the first time. And I've been hooked ever since. So I know what dark skies, what they really are. Um, I've then became interested in astronomy, um, it's been a, that's been a lifelong interest. And I, when I came to the UK in the 70s, initially I was in London and I, I expected it to be light polluted, so I didn't really think much about it. And then we moved to Bristol. Now, Bristol's a, I always think of it as a city a bit like Rome. It's a city of seven hills. <laughs> and up on a hill, standing up on a hill, looking down over, over the lights of the town, and you realise that the lights are shining upwards. Yeah. And they don't need to be. And that's when I that was in the late 80s. And I started getting interest in that. I made a programme for BBC Radio Bristol on light pollution, what we can do about it. Um, and that was my beginning of interest in it. We went then to live in, in Canada for a bit in Calgary. And the city authorities in Calgary wanted to change the street lighting, which was probably the worst light pollution from a city anywhere in North America, which mm. isn't anymore, I have to say. Um, not only has it got better, the um, the fracking site in North Dakota is now the worst by a very long way. Mm. But we're helping the, with through the um, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, we're helping the, them sort of get their, their street lights sorted out. And then you realise that things can, things can change. You can actually do things. You can make things better. Came back to the UK, been supporting Commission for Dark Skies, which is the British Astronomical Association um, organisation that deals with trying to preserve the dark skies, or trying to get them back. Um, um, then was supporting where I'm working now as a volunteer, helping with the bid for, to become an international dark sky reserve. And then suddenly... Um, they asked me if I'd work for them. So here I am. And uh, yay, I'm really enjoying it. So, you know, out of retirement to do something and get paid for something I do voluntarily anyway. I mean, that's that's just falling on your feet, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's, it's lovely to hear that you um, that your dark sky kind of initiation was, was in Africa. I, I, say, I, I don't know if you know, but I've, I've worked quite a bit in, in Africa, particularly Uganda and Kenya. And it's just the skies when you're in certain places are just jaw droppingly phenomenal. That kind of, the, like you say, the dark sky being able to just look up and, and it's just quite something, isn't it, the skies? It is. And it's something that so many people never have anymore. And that's such, mm -hmm. a, such a shame. I yeah. think it also, the people who are responsible for trying to get environmental stuff sorted out in this country, i.e. the government. Most of them have never seen a dark sky, so they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. They don't know what we're missing. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. it's like everything, isn't it? If you experience it, if you feel it, if you have that connection yeah. and you feel it, um, then you're passionate about it. And like you say, you make the change, don't you? Because you, you realise there is a better way of doing something. 
Um, can you tell us um, what the International Dark Sky Reserve is, please? Um, where it is also, oh, if, if there is a place, <laughs> um, and also what it aims to do? The title International Dark Sky Reserve is confirmed on places that they think worthy of it by an organisation based in Tucson, Arizona, called Dark Sky International, which is where the whole international dark sky movement started right back in the late 1980s. Um, there's 21 international dark sky reserves in the world, and seven of them are in the UK, which is pretty good. Oh, really? Um, they're not the darkest places. The dark places, the darkest places are called dark sky sanctuaries, and they are remarkably dark. But dark sky reserves are places where that have public access as well, and so you've got exceptional, distinguished quality of. Of, of starry nights and not just it's not just the sky it's the whole nocturnal environment that's important and that's where you know we're, we're going to get to anyway and it's protected for its scientific natural educational cultural heritage purposes and just for public enjoyment which is re which is really important you know there's no point having something that is beautiful if you're not sharing it <laughs> this i think this is a for me that's that's a given um it doesn't mean that it's an extra layer of planning or anything like that we're not a, even a statutory consultee for planning designations and i have to emphasize it's not about no lights the the little mantra i would like to get everybody to sort of get stuck into them is right light right place right time and that that's what we're all about what it does mean is that we will look at lighting we do consider it we do um advise people on it and my job really is to just encourage good practice education information which is sort of what i doing here really isn't it <laughs> so, uh, so that's that's my thing and yeah it's i'm very privileged to be able to do something like this i think oh that's really nice i think i'm actually going to title this right light right place right time sorry kind of like we have we're gonna have we're gonna hammer it home <laughs> um thank you yeah, that's good <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say just before I'm going to ask you what defines a dark sky. But if somebody is kind of like, and I know maybe also in this bit, you could also give us an example of where someone could go to kind of experience a dark sky. Um, maybe in the UK, maybe if you know somewhere in in America, uh, maybe somewhere in Europe. Um, although we do have people in Australia, we have we have worldwide listeners. But um, maybe you could just give us an idea of of somewhere where someone could go, so people could go, just they can experience it. Dark skies are, are are relative in a sense. Um, a really dark sky is where the Milky Way and the stars will, can actually cast a shadow on the ground. That's wow. dark. Wow. Um, they're very rare, and um, you can see phenomena like zodiacal light, which is a it's like a pyramid of light coming up just after sunset, where the where you've got dust in space, which is being illuminated by the sun below the horizon, and then Opposite the sun, so it'd be um, for us south at midnight, you get something called the gegenshine, which is basically it's, it's the reflection of the sun of these particles that's gone. On. Now, that's for me, that is a dark sky. For UK city dwellers, I mean, it just might mean the ability to see a few hundred stars at the same time at once. Um, for us, in the dark sky reserve really it means the ability to see something like the andromeda galaxy with your naked eye which is which is pretty impressive you know it's um two and a half million light years away and if you think about you know the light we're seeing left there before humans well before we were even australopithecus so it's, it's it's going back all coming back from a long way you know i mentioned it's about the um the people who legislate on this not knowing it and this is why i think it's important that they get to realize what a dark sky really is and it's not your urban dwellers thing oh just see a few hundred stars it's uh, it's that ability to to see into space and share something that every sighted human being ever has enjoyed until about 200 years ago mm -hmm. uh, united humanity um so where can you see them in the British Isles, the darkest place is probably the north, north of Scotland, round about Loch Loyal. But there are dark sky reserves. So where we are in central southern England, it's pretty dark. You know, so you can see the um, see the Milky Way easily. Um, and you can see the Andromeda Galaxy with your naked eye. 
there's places like Brecon Beacons in Wales, there's um, uh, Galloway Forest up in Scotland. There's there's lots and lots of places where you can go. North York Moors has just been given dark sky accreditation. So it's it's you can get there. In other parts of the world that are less populated. So if, for example, you're in Australia or America, you know, so go out into the desert. Deserts are wonderful for dark skies. Um, Southern Africa, Namibia. Namibia is now making a big tourism thing about its dark skies. So you can go to places like Saucers Flay, where you know, you, if you've never been somewhere dark before, you can see it. I have a friend who's just come back from Chile, which has been up in the Atacama. And again, absolutely stunning images coming out of that. So the, the places are available. They just might have to make a little bit of effort to get to them, but not that much. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so it's got people listening, you've got some places to go and visit and look and um, even to Google yeah. if you can't get out and, and or you can't get access to those. Um, and well, we'll, we'll look at some websites later, won't we? And, we, and oh. show people where they can go to to see where, where to find these places. Amazing. Thank you, Steve. That's brilliant. I want to ask you why dark skies are important um, for a lot of our listeners who are designers or they're planners, they're architects, and they understand the importance of like the circadian rhythm of lighting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if they're doing it within a building or inside the built environment, you know, inside of a build, you know, sort of built environment, they offer, obviously we have to do that through through lighting. We have the blue light going to the sort of cooler, you know, the the, the warmer lights during the day, and so our bodies can sleep and and all that all that's good stuff that we need <laughs> to rejuvenate and and things um obviously most of us operate during the light so we forget about what happens at night but but why are dark skies important i know there are so many different aspects from wildlife to actually the physic physical thing for us but um yeah I'm, because you're the expert I'm, I'm i've got you here so <laughs> tell us please <laughs> well it comes down to millions of years of evolution yeah, everything alive now on the planet is the result of millions of years of evolution and has evolved with, as you mentioned, the, the circadian rhythm, this cycle, this 24-hour cycle of light and dark. And we find that almost everywhere that we put light into darkness, there's some sort of measure of harm. And, and, th and this is, I think, what's important. Um, now I'll just take a few examples. Um, when I started this job um, a few years ago, one of the first people to call me up was a local farmer. And this was November, getting up for four o'clock in the morning milking, when it's supposedly dark, he could hear wrens and robins singing in the hedgerows. And he, you know, as someone who works on the land and who loves nature, he knew there was something wrong. And he thought it might be associated with his lighting. So we went and had a look at the light, and yes, it was. Now, if you've got birds singing when they should be sleeping, they're going to get exhausted. Reproductive success goes down. And, you know, we wonder why we have a depletion of songbirds. And this is one of the causes of it. Um, also with birds, migrating birds. Now, the, the numbers are horrifying. We don't know how many birds worldwide, migrating birds worldwide, are killed as a direct result of life. What we do know is it's somewhere between 3 billion and 11 billion every year. Not million, what? billion. In North America alone, recent study has shown somewhere between 8 million and 10 million birds are killed as a direct result of lit communication towers every year it's this is horrendous so sad yeah you know, i i needn't say any more about that then you take human health as a as a the, the other or another end of it and now i noticed well a number of us noticed back in the 1980s there seemed to be a correlation between artificial light at night and breast cancer we thought oh come on how can it be related you know statistical coincidence got to be and then um a researcher showed that women who were profoundly blind in both eyes also had a lower instance of breast cancer and right, right there's got to be a mechanism we didn't know what it was but it's very unlikely then to be a coincidence we now know what it is and it's the circadian disruption that you were talking about. Mm. Um, now, it's not that it's going to cause cancers or anything like that, but it makes people more susceptible to them. Mm. So it's 
Um, it's so that's the one extreme. And so it's things like prostate cancer, endometrial cancers as well, exacerbated by it. And this has been shown now with a study of, um, I think it was 120,000 nurses in the USA by uh, Professor Eva Schoenhammer. Um, now, the reason for using nurses is that you're, you're getting rid of a lot of other confounders in the study, you know, like social class and all the rest of it, which, which can affect these things. And yeah, there are social class implications to light pollution as well, but yeah. um, it's different. And so this isn't a small study. This is real, and it's just and it's just been replicated. And it's the whole way through. It's things like reduced cognition and creativity mm-hmm. as a result of circadian disruption. It's the things that we... Um, now called, you know, the diseases of modern living. So you're looking at obesity, diabetes, um, hypertension, all of those things. And it's quite simple. It's just the light at the wrong time, the wrong sort of light at the wrong time, um, mucks up a hormone called leptin, which is the one that tells you when you feel full. So yeah. the, but the other one is the, is the um, disruption of melatonin. And that's the one that messes up sleep cycles and all the rest of it. And a consequence for us is it's very, very similar just to working unhealthy shift patterns. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's that's now well established as something that is harmful. And just having the wrong sort of light at night mm. at the wrong time and the rest of it is is in, is now known to be implicated in that to the extent that in uh, 2016, the American Medical Association classed um, artificial light at night as a human health hazard. It's it is as simple as that. It's not all light. I think we have to be we we, we have to be very clear about that. If you think about what light does naturally during the day, so uh, at midday, obviously, you know, it's this blue, bright, white light that you get from sunlight, and. I think most of us know if you go out for a walk first thing in the morning when it's you know it's when it's getting light it wakes you up and it invigorates you and gets you ready for the day but the light at sunset or after sunset and also pre- the pre-dawn light is more this sort of it's, it's this warm honey golden color light and that is what we've evolved with at light and it's a similar thing you get from firelight but once you start putting ultra bright um leds like that you know the harsh white ones the ones that have actually got a lot of blue in the spectrum those are the ones that are damaging but they will wake you up if you've got to do you know sort of, you know cognitive work at night then yes you want that sort of light it's actually healthier for you to have it when you're doing that sort of work but if you're relaxing you want to get the color temperature right down so it's nice and warm and that and then we can do then it's not nearly as disruptive to us Another side of this is something that most people will have noticed. Certainly if you drive, you don't wipe nearly as many bugs off your windscreen or your number plate as you used to, even five years ago. In the last 30 years, we have lost, according to Farming Today, a couple of weeks ago, 63% of our insect population in this country. That's nuts. That's nuts. And we are on target to lose 40% of what's left in the next 30 years. This is crazy. It's, you know, we could lose everything with a backbone on this planet and the planet would thrive. You lose everything without a backbone, this planet dies within months. You know, we're basically, uh, you are decompose. It's not just pollination, it's your decomposers as everything else. But the insect thing is is pretty awful. Um, what happens is that the... Um, they get attracted to light, one thing, and then they, and if, you know, the moths flying around the light, about 30% of those will die that night. But those that aren't, what they're not doing is they're not pollinating, they're not reproducing, they're not foraging. And so it's hardly surprising that insect populations have, have completely collapsed, mm-hmm. and they're calling it the insectageddon or the insect extinction mm-hmm. be- because of this. It's now people are starting to take notice because the economic harm is now not being found. So take one example. Gala apples, so one variety of apple in one county, Kent, the shortfall due to poor pollination now is thought to be about, cost about five million pounds a year. So now people are starting to take notice of it because there's that financial impact. I have to say, it's not just light. 
okay light is one of the four big ones the other ones are the ones we all know about climate change habitat loss pesticide use but light is some studies suggest it's the most important but it doesn't matter whether it's the most important or not it's the easiest one to deal with yeah literally you can end light pollution with a flick of a switch mm. it, i mean okay it's a bit more complicated than that you know you really want to get the right light in but it, it is so simple and everybody wins there are no losers except for people who sell energy and people who sell rubbish lights but <laughs> they they lose out but everybody else wins the whole planet wins if we get lighting right so let's do it why install a lousy light when you could just as easily install a good one and that's you know it's, it, it's, well that's yeah. the way i see it anyway yeah absolutely and all the technology now iot and all this sort of stuff where we've got sensors on lights where they can come on when somebody walks in so they keep it to keep yeah. the area safe i know we're going to talk about that in a bit but um you know there's there's all these different solutions that we can uh, with technology we can combine our kind of advancements if we want to. So there's people who still make money. Um, but yeah. I mean, if you think about the bigger picture, like you say, once people realize, oh, it's going to put, you know, it's actually going to cost me like the gala apples, um, which you just mentioned. I mean, that's, but I can't believe 60, how many, 63% did you say of our insects? 53% in the last 30 years. Um, so that, sad. I mean, that's that's an one official estimate. The charity Bug Life. Mm who obviously look at stuff like this, um, they have slightly different figures um, over a different yeah. time span, but it's the same ballpark thing. Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, there are parts of the world now where crops that used to be insect pollinated are now pollinated by human hand. Yes. And of course, the human hand is usually uh, the hands of small children from poor families. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, could, so this would be apples in southwest China. This mm. would be um, blueberries in parts of Canada, would you believe? Um, uh, oranges in Israel. Mm. You know, this is French beans in Kenya. It's it, this. Is, this is a global issue, and mm. it's it's and it's one we really have to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, and we can. That's the thing. Yeah, we can. Ex exactly. Exactly. Um, and I think this is one of the wonderful things. You know, we, we have we have planners here. We have architects listening to this. We have designers listening to this. We have lighting experts, you know, people that kind of install these lights. I mean, how amazing if we could bring all our voices together to go right this time. We're going to put a different sort of light outside. We're not going to put these ones that shine up. Yes, they might look amazing, but let's do something different. Um, I, like really, where it's needed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like you say, the right light, right place and the right time. Um, I mean, you mentioned about the insects dying when we leave our lights on. Um, is this because they're attracted to it, isn't it? Is that? But, yeah. it, it, but it's not just that. If you, again, if you drive, you will know that the lights you hate coming at you when the, the opposing yeah. driver forgets to dip them are those really intensely white ones yeah now if you look at that you, and you could see it if it if you've got wet brain drops or you just squint your eyes a little bit yeah you you'll get it'll go a bit fuzzy and you'll see there's a lot of blue in it mm. and the the reason there's blue is that the leds naturally produce light very strongly in a blue part of the spectrum if anyone's techie minded it's around about 450 nanometer wavelength that's nobody's fault. Nobody decided, hey, we're, we're going to do this because that's where it's most harmful. But it is most harmful. That's the wavelength that mostly, um, most easily harms your melatonin, cause, you know, causes melatonin dysregulation. That's the wavelength that does that. It's also a wavelength which now shown that some, it will, is literally lethal to some insects. You put fruit flies under that color of blue light for, 24 hours, you give them everything else they need to live, and they will all do exactly the same thing. They will die. Oh. We, now, we don't know why yet. Mm. It's probably something to do with damaging mitochondria, is, is what the thought is. Um, we don't know, but it's, it's, that same, it's that same wavelength. Now, we can, we've got the tech that we don't have to have a high peak in the blue um, in in LED lighting. So and the normal way to do this is to reduce the color temperature. So you, you get away from this harsh blue rich white light, which also attracts insects, which is again, is you know, paradoxical, it attracts them more, but it's also more lethal to them. Um, and by going to, you know, you get 
light down to a color temperature of around about 2200 Kelvin. That's the CCT that you see on LEDs. It means correlated color temperature, and you just want to get it low. So you around 220, uh, sorry, 2200 Kelvin, and you've got very little of that blue, and it's almost like warm candlelight. And people say, but you don't get good colors under it. No, under old LEDs, that was true. Yeah, okay, your color rendition goes to pot, and everything, you know, human beings look dead after it, which is horrible. Modern ones, you can get the color rendering index right up, and everything looks natural. And we so we can take the, the benefit of LED lighting, which is really, really cheap way of producing light, very energy effective, and combine it with something that is not harmful to us, to the environment, to everything else. And it's, you know, we've mentioned animals. It's also plants, would you believe? You can find all over the internet, you'll find pictures, um, trees near streetlights. The bit of the tree that's near a streetlight will come into bud earlier. Mm. It will lose its leaves later in autumn. And ultimately, it'll lose about 20% of its lifespan as well. There are There was a case of a soya crop somewhere in the States, I can't remember where, um, in fields next to a prison. The prison changed the lighting to very high intensity blue rich lighting basically the the prop around there where it was being lit just died Gosh. it's it's ev i said it's everywhere we look mm. um you know you get moths producing hormones to the wrong recipe and not enough of them um frogs um, female frogs want to get the reproduction over quickly with because they don't want to be predated upon. Yeah. But the male tree frogs just go silent in the night. So, um, coral spawning gets completely messed up. Migration patterns get messed up. You know, it's, it could go on and on and on. It's everywhere we look. This light that we're using is doing something that we really don't need it to be doing. And to keep saying it is something we can do something about. Yeah. This and this is the this, there's no point in me coming on here and saying this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible. You can't do anything about it. No, of course we can. We but we know what the answers are. We just have to implement them. Yeah. So can you can you give us some uh, sort of practical advice on how to light our environments? You know, it's what maybe we should should be doing. Maybe shouldn't be doing, but what we definitely should be doing. It's it's incredibly simple. It comes down to this right light, right place, right time we're talking about now dark sky international has a basically the, the five principles of responsible outdoor lighting at night so the first one the light needs to have a purpose is it useful if it doesn't have a clear purpose don't do it um you know if it's not useful by definition it's useless so why bother um lights need to be targeted so you light the areas that need to be lit and you constrain the light so it's only lighting where it needs to be lit you don't need to light, you know, your neighbor's bedroom window or anything like that. You don't need to light the underbellies of um, migrating birds at night or mm. aircraft or anything like that. Shine it down, put it where it's needed. Now, we've also got this crazy idea that some have got, you know, some light good, more light better, where it obviously isn't, you know, we, we use lampshades for a reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. puts too much light in your eye, you, you get something called disability glare. Yeah. So you don't use light any brighter than is than is necessary for the task. Don't say, oh yes, that's great. Oh, let's let's treble the brightness of that and make it even brighter. You don't we don't need to do that. Just keep it down. It also saves energy. So you're then having, you know, the kickoffs into um less energy production, less carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. therefore we're again contributing to helping mitigate climate change as well yeah. then there's this warm color light that we talk about use as warm color as possible now there are some exceptions i have to say with insects um, most insects are going to be adversely affected by by blue light the, the cold white light the the one that is adversely affected by warm white light is glowworms oh yeah a, a friend actually has a red light on her doorbell oh. and um she came back one night and there were there were three male glow worms on it trying to mate with it <laughs> which is <laughs> they're, they're attracted to that but you know we 
if the light then is the fifth principle, if we control it, so motion detectors, timers, anything like that, then the light's only on when it's needed. This is the right time um, side of the right light, right place, right time. And, and, and then you don't get all these harms. You know, yeah, yeah you, no one's trying to say, don't use any light at all. Don't shine light into the environment um, at all. You know, living things can cope with little bits of disruption. It's this constant, mm. almost, you know, sort of 24-hour light that is harmful. And so firelight, you know, sit, sit around a campfire. You know, so you, you're out with a few friends. Well, of course you're going to use a torch, you know, and things like that. It, these things don't matter. If you really want to light up your garden with fairy lights around Christmas to make your house look pretty, well, this is part of our culture. You know, we mm -hmm. this, this taking light into the darkness at that mm -hmm. dark time of the year is part of our culture. We don't have to throw it away. We just have to do it sensibly mm -hmm. and don't do it all the time. Make it really special. <laughs> and then, then it's fine. Then it's good. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm taking some, definitely something away from this is the is the yellow light I and mean, I, I love I love the little lights in the garden and, and things like that and I like to think that they're kind of all facing down and there's very few of them um, but um, yeah I'm just making sure I've got the right color temperature and things so I've, I'm, I think I have I'm going to double check to make sure I have because I wouldn't I, oh god I'd hate to I've almost got blood on my hands actually that's the, it's ultimately yeah. what it is isn't it yeah. really it yeah. is um, one of the things I take heart from is the really cheap outdoor lights that people use, the you know the, the solar ones mm. quite often. Yeah. They give this harsh blue light, yes, but they usually only last a couple of months before they pack up. So, yeah, so but you, no, you don't have to do that. You can get solar lights which are, have a a nice low color temperature, and they're not as easy to get, mm -hmm. but they are they're available. If people went for those, then you can. You, know, you can get the benefits of 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 both worlds. You know, you can have it solar, and you can have decent quality light, and they've got usually passive infrared detectors on them, so um, they will only come on for you know maybe a couple of minutes as you pass them, and then when you're gone, they're gone as well. Yeah, I, that's lovely. That kind of light sensor based stuff i think is good i'm just wondering if you people have got it and they've spent some money on them i suppose they could put a shading around them that's yellow they could just get a yellow yeah. kind of shading that goes around them to warm them up so they don't have to yes I mean, they're worried about yeah. like throwing things away or, or that kind of stuff you know i think if it was if it's me i'm actually i'm going to double check i'm sure mine are yellow <laughs> um but um yeah. but if they're not then I, I just i might just just put a little paint color you know very light kind of white yellow kind of yeah. wash around the right. edge of the just something um yeah gosh i don't i've I, just I been just working feel... with a local festival yeah um uh mu music festival that was taking place in the dark sky reserve and they wanted to get things right and they're using tower floodlights well it's yeah. the first thing to point them down but also their color temperature was too high yeah so i had a, i had a word with the supplier and they said well yeah we could sort that we could put filters on them for you oh yeah filters. and it cost yeah. them a little bit but and they did that. And, you know, the, the festoon lights that they have at festivals, you know, those yes. strings of lights, about a third of that goes upwards. We didn't want that. Oh. They spent, I think it was a £1,000, on having little shades, yeah. little cowls made for the festoon light. So five kilometres of festoon light had little coloured cowls on them. It looked beautiful. Oh. And the trees were not being lit up above them. And this is, it's so easy to do. Yeah, exactly. If people if people just want to do it and take those steps, we can do it. Yeah, exactly. And how how great to be a designer to in, to put that into your design as well. Yeah. It's like an extra layer, isn't it? It's an extra yeah. subtle layers that um that I mean we talk about sustainable design, but now this whole thing about regenerative design. How amazing that your design also includes a light um design or a light sort of solution that actually regenerates the the insect population in that area i mean it's just so subtle but oh my god what a phenomenal impact that would have um have you seen enhanced life you, yeah exactly. you'd like to enhance life yeah yeah how amazing i mean how amazing um i'm so glad that you've come on thank you so much for your time um has there been a change uh since you've been campaigning for um for dark skies have you seen a change 
Oh gosh, yes. Um, 30 years ago, or more, you know, he's saying light's a pollutant. People want to send for the people in white coats to take you away. So he used to say, <laughs> how can light be a pollutant? Um, he used to say, well, if, you know, I wish light smelt like sewage. And then, then we wouldn't we wouldn't have a problem with dealing with it. <laughs> but obviously, that's a, it's a, yeah. No, so, so first of all, that is a change. People now talk about light pollution. They recognise that light's a pollutant. So that's the beginning. Secondly, we've become really much more conscious about the quality of the light. Mm. You know, this, the, the colour temperature and what's called the colour rendering index. We're much, much more aware of that now. We weren't 30 years ago. You know, it was it was light. And yeah, yeah we, we like the sodium street lights because you could filter those out easily. Mm. Um, but we know, we now know much more about it. And we've also in that become aware that this, um, the blue light is an interesting one. Um, the reason the sky is blue is, is because the blue end of the spectrum scatters in the atmosphere. Okay. So when they put the satellites up to measure light pollution, they, well, the, the blue light scatters in the atmosphere. So the sense on that weren't so sensitive to the blue. Okay. So we've been underestimating the advance of light pollution for about the last 25 years, which is, uh, so it's it's actually a bit worse than we thought. But light pollution is currently um, increasing around somewhere between five and 10 times as much, as fast as the population's increasing. Yeah. Which means That's... that more and more and more, a higher, well, a higher and higher and higher um, proportion of people never see a dark sky, never see darkness. Um, and the other one, of course, is LED. It has moved from um, incandescent lighting to LED lighting via the horrible compact fluorescent things that we all <laughs> encourage to use for a while. That meant light's much cheaper, so more people are lighting up at night. And this this is an issue. They um, instead of thinking, oh, it's cheaper, I can just save a heck of a lot of money. Oh, it's cheaper, I'll spend the same amount of money, maybe even a little bit more, and put more light out there. Oh, don't do that. We really don't need it. So this is this is the sort of thing that um, um, we need. We need this, this change in consciousness. So let's just save it. Yeah, is that, I was just I was just thinking about you know during. Well, you know, my mother was was older kind of thing and she was doing true during the war <laughs> um but she used to talk about it. she remembered the gas lighter that used to come around and if you think about it i mean obviously we don't want to use gas but that light was very was very warm obviously because it was the flame um so obviously the pictures that you see and everything like that it was a everything was different and slower and warmer and um yeah just just different so i was just i was just thinking about that and all this particularly relevant but just that there was you know there has been a different way that we used to light um that was actually okay um and and sort of safer for for everybody so what frustrates what frustrates you most um in your sort of dark sky work obviously is it the media is it lack of awareness or or what is it that frustrates you most oh well, there's it's probably uh, plenty there's a, few, <laughs> yeah, there's a few things um there's people who just automatically assume without even talking to us to think about it we just want to turn all the lights out yeah so a friend of mine is, is having a trying to have a conversation with his local football club which they got the floodlights which you know light up the sky and everything else from us and they won't even listen to him when he said no i'm not trying to get you to turn them out we're not trying to stop football happening just mm -hmm. light the pitch just mm -hmm. like put that's easy to do and there are more and more places doing it Mm -hmm. But people think, you know, they want to send us back into some sort of medieval type of darkness when the only nocturnal activities you could do was, you know, when the yeah. when the uh, full moon was shining. Yeah. Uh, hence yeah. the, the old lunar societies that, would, you know, they, they'd meet yeah. uh, uh, according to the phase of the moon because then they could get home safely. We don't want to go back to that. We don't need to go back to that. This is not what it's about. So that's first one. Second one is there is this assumption that light at night confers safety. And there's no evidence at all that it does. There is some evidence, admittedly very weak evidence, that actually darkness confers safety at night. Um, you know, you think of it, you know, highwaymen in the old days, operated by moonlight. <laughs> they needed to, they needed to see. We, we've got instances of where lights have gone out in a street and the car crime moved to adjacent lit streets Oh. where people can see what they're breaking into. You know, light, light isn't intelligent. It doesn't 
help the good guys and harm the bad guys. Light, light, light is neutral, and it's it's mm. how we use it. I and mean, you know, we've got to think this one through. If light conferred safety, then the safest places on the planet at night would be brightly lit city centres, mm -hmm. urban centres. And they're clearly not. Mm -hmm. um, there was a case nearby where the council were talking about having part light switch offs, and people say, well, you can't switch it off there, it's a trouble spot. Well, hang on, let's think this through. It's lit now, and there's trouble there, so it's obviously not the light. The light is clearly not preventing the trouble. Mm -hmm. In fact, the the experience is if you turn the lights off somewhere like that, the trouble moves somewhere else. I mean, it doesn't go away completely, but you know, you can, it shifts it. But um, quite often, yeah. you know, sort of mm -hmm. bad lighting. It's just a courtesy. It's just courtesy lights mm -hmm. for people who are up to no good right. or beacon to say, hey, the owners of this premises think there's something here worth stealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's the other one. But lastly, for, for this, you know, for the UK, it's the central government has actively declined to address it. So when the Environment Act was going through the House of Lords a couple of years ago, um, Zach Goldsmith insisted that there was no reason to include light pollution because light pollution was being dealt with and would automatically be dealt with um, by everything else. Well, well, no, it's increasing at at least 10% per year. So no, that is that is not dealing with it. And whenever questions asked in parliament the defra spokesperson who comes out to do it, it always says yes it's under control fortunately there's just been a house of lords science and technology committee consultation on this and they are now saying they have to measure it they have to look at it um this is and it's really important we do this and we have and this is purely looking at the health effects of it that's all they were looking at they were looking at health, health effects of of artificial light at night and noise and that DEFRA is now being pushed to, to monitor it, and then perhaps we can get a change. Perhaps we can see um, light being ha having to be controlled in a, in a much better way. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm not I'm not convinced that's necessarily going to be fast enough. I don't know. Um, so I think really what's going to happen is the movement, the pressure to do this has got to come from us. It's got to come from people deciding whether they're going to take matters into their own hands and deal with themselves and then push the authorities to do something about it. So yeah. it's a, it's the, and it's the old one, well, maybe I'm just an old hippie, I don't know, but the <laughs> idea of, you know, you sort of think globally, act locally, just take yeah. control of what you can take control of and eventually things will happen. Yeah, exactly. And this is like the, the Chinese thing, isn't it? You kind of, you drop the you know water every water droplets go in you know little tiny mm. water droplets and eventually you bore a hole in in a rock so actually yeah. that's kind of what we are if we all do our thing you know whether you're a designer yeah. or an architect whatever it is or even a homeowner you know you're in you're in a you work you're working in a hospital and you have a you have chance to control anything or to buy mm. differently you can just buy better you can just buy an alternative next time you have to replace yeah. um just these just these little things well, then add up and then you'll have like little echoes, you know, your ecosystems, your little biodiversity will gradually grow. Well, we've done that here. We kind of had a bit of rewilding going on outside. Mm. A little, it's a little yeah. public area. And I've, although it looked messy, nice. I was like so determined. Mm. No, no, we're going to keep it. And the insects yeah. that we've seen, the butterflies, we've had peacock butterflies. You know, we're on the edge of a little town um, and just mm. the life that's come in just by putting. And it's it's not big. <laughs> it's mm. not big, um, you know. No. Yeah, but it, so it, it, it this happens, done. and yeah, and and then you'll find other things coming as well. You know, you do your no, your no yeah. mow may, as they were calling it for a few years. Yeah, and well, my 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 lawn is now a meadow. It's not a lawn at all, yeah. <laughs> which I'm re really and it's because people are, and there's no longer any shame in not cutting your grass every week or something like that. Yeah. You know, people are now beginning to realize, yeah, th this is this is what we need for life. Let's do it. Let's go exactly positively on that. Yeah, ex exactly. And you don't need to keep watering it as well because the grass is longer yeah. and it's acting as a... So yeah. there's a win-win. You don't need less... You need less water. Mm -hmm. It's just let, na let nature do its thing. Obviously, you can trim yeah. it. You can have your little walk pathways through so You can still make it look beautiful. Yeah. We just need a different way. Let's, let's give it a bit of a boost. It's almost like we need a bit yeah. of a... You know, Use less energy because you're not mowing it so much. It's, it's exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everything wins. Yes, Everything exactly. Wins. Yeah, exactly. We're so, we're so frustrated. So, paranoid with making everything so 
sort of pristine and perfect but actually mm -hmm. we don't thrive like that and that's something that this whole biophilic design's about it's about creating spaces and places where it's more natural so we have those different patterns we have the different stimuli and that whole non-rhythmic thing that we always forget about you know we kind of things that don't move <laughs> are also bad because it's like a storm coming or something from the primal thing mm -hmm. from us so having the waves of 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 like grasses and things in your garden and, and stuff is also good for us because it has that whole um you know changing patterns for us um i do want to ask you what you what you'd like to see change we're kind of nearing the end so um but yeah. I, what would you what would you like to see change um well in this country i'd like to see outside light removed from permitted development um, yeah. there is no rule so if you're if you're a householder that you can't um put a you know sort of 5,000 watt spotlight shining into the sky in your house. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. Um, so I'd like to see legislation to actually prevent light from being shone upwards, shone onto rivers and lakes and that as well, because actually it has a harmful effect on the water. Uh, the, it um, affects the, the plankton, which is the base of your aquatic food chain. Yeah. And I'd like to see a change to people using light, only the light that's necessary. And that includes necessary for social interaction. Mm. Of course it does. But to th think, you know, to a change, I'd like to see a change in consciousness there. Whether it'll happen, I don't know. Mm. I'm sure it will. Yeah, well, we're going to have um, a biophilic design conference in the first week of November 2024. And there's going to be a stream on sound, but there's also going to be a stream on light. So, Steve, you're coming. <laughs> just going to say, I'm just going to hook you in and you're going to have to speak. So um, and people need to know about this stuff. Um, and then also we spark discussion afterwards. So um, if people want to find out more, um, Steve, where, what websites uh, can they do or what can they do to help support or, and be mindful of lighting? Yeah, well, the first place to go to, I think, the good starting place is the Dark Sky International website, which is darksky, one word, dot org, no one gene. Um, then there's our UK version of that, which is darksky.uk. Okay. Um, these, the organisation that's been doing it for longest in this country is the Commission for Dark Skies, which is on the British Astronomical Association website. So it's Britastro, one word, dot org, forward slash dark hyphen skies, plural. And then have a look at Bug Life as well, um, buglife.org.uk, because they, they they do a lot on um, on light, as well as all the other things that harm bugs. That's worth it. And then there's the most marvellous book. It's beautifully written, even though it is in translation by someone called Johan Ekloff, it's called, it's called the Darkness Manifesto, and it's you know you get get the electronic version if you if you broke or something like that. It, you know, get a Kindle. It's inexpensive. It's beautifully written, and if not if that doesn't convince you, we need to protect the night. Nothing will. It's it's a wonderful book. So wow. the Darkness Manifesto, yeah, and Eckloff. Oh, amazing thank you so much and i'm going to put um links to all these things on the spiel that goes with the podcast and also on our website journal of and um, alongside the podcast we've got here um so thank you so much so before i ask you the final question <laughs> um which i ask everybody on the podcast is there anything else that you'd like to add at this point yes first thing is artificial light at night has increased the participation of women and girls and we have to be very very careful that we don't increase the perception that they may have that we are making the world less safe for them by for, by advocating for responsible light at night. This is it's so it's one of these things we've got to be. It's so easy to do that. Now mm. we are human. We act on perception, not on statistics. So we so that's one thing we have to be very very careful about. And the other thing is there is a social justice issue with light. The worst lit urban places in particular are generally where the poorer people live. Mm. And by worst, you know, it's, and it's sometimes intentional because the authorities think, oh, poor, poverty, crime, let's chuck the light in and it'll stop crime. Well, all, all of that is wrong. Um, so it means that the people in those places are subject to the greatest health risks and harms from artificial light at night. So that's that. And then this, oh, I said it before, just... Why install a lousy light when you could install a good one just as easily? And that's 
I click that right right, right place, right time, oh, forever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just going to just go for that, so a whole light equity and things. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's all to do with that design, isn't it? It's designing the spaces, yes. and often those spaces where there's, um, like, you know, poorer places, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I came from a ordinary background. Um, I mean, it was quite nice, but there was like air pockets around that was very concrete, very white, you know, very white ashen kind of buildings. It was very harsh and and sort of it would it it was it was bad for us. We know now that these colorways and everything like that with no beauty and no trees and everything was was is bad. Um, but the lighting is just going to actually accent the whiteness and the grayness of everything anyway which i think adds to the kind of personality um aggravation um and frustrations that people have which we also know about through you know the environmental psychology side of things so if you're a designer again being able to create a beautiful beautifully lit space which is tunable which changes during the day if it needs to, it doesn't need to come on all the time, um, but actually, and it's also beautifully designed. So the light itself is is beautiful. Um, so t- you inject some beauty in it as well as some trees, of course. Anyway, that's um, that's the thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to stop waffling. Yes. Right. So I just we got to the final bit. So uh, the question I ask everybody at the end of the podcast, um, Steve, and I'm so looking forward to hearing what you say. If you could paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia, what would it look like? You warned me about this one, and I give it some thought. I think something that's gone from many people's lives has been an opportunity to feel awe at the natural world. And I think, well, try to imagine a well-lit world. And I don't mean a world that's brightly lit, but one where everybody has the amount and quality, especially quality of light, that they need to enable themselves to live healthily, to live fulfilling lives, and not be subjected to light that they neither need nor want. Then every single human being, ultimately, and especially every child, that really is, could experience the incredible awe that accompanies seeing a truly, truly, truly dark starry sky, and not just once, but as often as they want. Come back to it. This is the thing, the one thing that has united every single sighted human being for millennia until we started pumping it away. And to to bring that back, to people to realise how utterly, utterly fantastic a dark, darkness is, you know, a dark sky. I, I would love that to be the case. And I think make everybody feel better thank you for listening to the journal of biophilic design podcast